The Incas by Nigel Davies. Chapter 7 The Imperial System. The Relevant Evidence. Having st studied certain aspects of the imperial infrastructure, I now turn to the systems employed by the Incas to govern, govern rather, their empire. As in the case of accounts of Inca conquest, the problem once more arises of interlinked records, at times promptly copied from one another with mere variations in spelling. A number of chroniclers deal with major aspects of imperial rule, such as the powers of provincial governors and other officials generally described as visitors, the status of the Caracas, the system of justice, the ownership of wealth, the redistribution of merchandise, as well as the somewhat theoretical application of the decimal system as a means of controlling Indian communities and their labor service. The problem of such sources has been studied by Ake Wadin. He explains that much of the basic information derives from two early local chronicles, that of Damian de la Bandera, on the region of Huamanga, written in 1557, and that of Cristobal de Castro and Diego Ortega Morejon on Chincha, written in 1558. A third account is that of Hernando de Santillan, probably dating from 1563. Wedding as a fourth, anonymous source, La Relación del Origen del Gobierno que los Incas tuvieron por señores que se vieron al Inca Yupangi y a Opa Yupanqui, which he calls simply Los Señores. Wither first proceeds to demonstrate that at least part of Santillan's text is copied from De La Banderas. He cites three passages from the two chroniclers on the distribution of the herds of llamas, the system of marriage, and the punishment of crime, that not only give the same inf information but also contain certain phrases copied word for word from De La Bandera by Santillan. One might add to Wither's observations the fact that another passage, in which De La Bandera sums up some, in some 500 words the overall system of provincial government imposed by Tupac and Juana Capac is reproduced by Santillan with only minor adjustments. Wedding also sets out a synoptic table of the material presented by Castro and Ortega, Señores, and Santillan. He is able to demonstrate that the three accounts offer their basic data in, a, in almost exactly the same order and bear an uncanny resemblance to each other. Wedding's table shows that Santillan also gives fairly copious additional information not contained in the other two sources. A further problem arises because Los Señores turn out to be a mere copy of De La Bandera's work, with the exception of the last six pages, which are preceded by a statement that the previous text was indeed written by Damián de la Bandera in the city of Huamanga. The differences between the, the two texts amount to nothing more than variations in spelling and the use of accents. In one instance, a single line in De La Bandera on the division of contingents of a thousand Indians into ten groups of a hundred is, apparently mistakenly, omitted from Los Señores. It may be fair to add that the available text of Los Señores, published in 1921, was re-edited in about 1572 based on an earlier version that no longer exists. Others, other sources provide important information on the Inca system of government. For instance, Ciesa and Sarmiento write about Inca provincial governors. Polo de Ondegardo is another valuable source much used by Murra in writing of land distribution. But once more, the question of copying and repetition arises. Murra points out that some of Polo's original comments, for instance, on the land holdings of the Inca state and church, are reproduced almost exactly by Acosta and by Cobo, who may also have had some information from sources no longer available. In another instance, Polo's information is copied by Acosta, Montesinos, and Cabello. Hence, it must be borne in mind that studies of Inca provincial rule cite many sources, but that the relevance of these sources depends on the degree to which their material is original as opposed to mere repetition of another work. Governors and Visitors Many sources report that each province of the Inca Empire was ruled by a governor chosen from the ranks of the Inca elite. These officials resided in the main provincial centers, which invariably contained a temple of the Inca sun god. Siesta mentions some of these provincial capitals, Cabeceras, including early conquests such as Bonbon and Chaucha, as well as distant centers in Ecuador and Chile. He writes of the presence of silversmiths and other artisans in these places, as well as strong garrisons implicitly manned by a loyal Mitime groups on whom the governor could depend to combat external attack or internal uprisings. The chronicler observes that in cases where the Incas failed to settle such Mitime groups, they often were faced with serious revolts. The governors were orejones of high status, the Gran Confianza. The majority of them possessed property in the vicinity of Cusco. If any governor spent too much time in his Cusco dom domain, he was removed from office. And periodically, the reigning monarch would visit a province where he was received by his representative with elaborate pomp and ceremony.
Siesa adds that he came to know a few governors who continued to, ex to exercise a certain authority in their province even after the Spanish conquest. Damián de la Manera, writing in the province of Huamanga, states that the governor had his capital in Vilcas and that his domain stretched for 50 leagues from Uramarca, 6 leagues distance from Vilcas, as far as Acos on the edge of the Chaucha Valley. The Relaciones Geográficas in the report or on Huamanga confirmed that the governor resided in Vilcas and merely differ in describing the event of his province as 40 leagues. Morua describes the governors, who were always orejones, as viceroys. They had, the, they had the privilege of traveling in a litter. They were responsible for the construction of temples and fortresses, as well as roads and bridges. Mention of the high status of provincial governors is also to be found in other sources. Polo de Onda Gardo refers briefly to governors, stating that they were obeyed by all. Sarmiento mentions the governors quite frequently in his description of the reigns of Pachacutec, Tupac, and Huayna Capac. Sally Moore observes that the question remains open as to how far the office of governor might have been hereditary, as some sources state, and as Siesa perhaps implies when he mentions a continuance of their influence in certain cases after the, f after the fall of the empire. It is also hard to determine whether the governors possessed lands in the provinces they ruled in addition to their estates in the Cusco region. It appears that they could obtain funds from the lands owned by the state in each province, but it is not clear whether they derived most of their income from such lands. More cites horses, including Kobo, who ride the of the governors as personal holdings in provinces, but concludes that no certainty exists that the Inca governors had such private lands, nor that their families had an enduring interest in local state and church property. Mura, though stressing the power exercised by these governors, the Quechua word Dokuyak means he who sees all, admits that it is hard to be specific about their precise functions. The data from each province, recorded in Kipu form, were all sent to Cusco, but we know little of, of the specialists who handled this information, and it appears that such records disappear very soon after the Spanish conquest. In addition to governors Tokriok, or Tokrikok rather, reportedly resident in their respective provinces, these sources also write of a different class of officials usually described as visitors, or Tokoyrikok, who appear from time to time to report on the proper functioning of, sp of specific aspects of imperial rule. Castro and Ortega wrote of envoys called Runakipo, who were sent by the Inca to verify statistics on population provided by Kipus. Another category of visitor, Ochacamayo, was responsible for the administration of justice and the collection of tribute. Castro and Ortega do not describe resident provincial governors. By contrast, De La Bandera mentions the presence of a governor in each province. The, the latter also writes of visitadores. The first category of visitors to be named is that of the Ochai Kakamayok a title referred to by Castro and Ortega. Both sources attribute a similar function to this, of, to this official, the punishment of crime. Two other types of visitors are also named by De La Manera, one responsible for checking keeping records, another for the overseeing the care of the Mamaconas, the women devoted to the cult of the sun. In a subsequent passage, the same source again refers to both resident governors and to visitors sent to each province every three years. Santiago mentions visitors in a passage that is partly copied from De La Bandera. Sarmiento also writes of visitadores as distinct from the governors whom they visited periodically. They returned to Cusco after two years and were concerned with such matters as land cultivation and payment of tribute. Other high officials, described as Orejones Proveedores, were sent to supervise the construction and maintenance of roads. In another passage, the same chronicler writes of visitors sent to collect tribute. Siesa, in a brief passage, also mentioned Orejones acting as judges. These were sent each year to oversee the levying of tribute and the administration of justice. Because of the apparent overlapping of the functions of governors and visitors, it has at times been questioned whether any true distinction should, should be made between the two. This is surely a question of major importance, but in such a tightly controlled empire, if the different provinces were ruled by a resident governor, it might be logical to suppose that he would in turn be subject to periodic inspection by officials specializing in accounting and relating matters including deliveries of goods to Cusco, or in the construction of roads, as mentioned by certain sources. But it is surely also reasonable to suppose that such an empire, in which only limited power was delegated to the Caracas, could hardly be governed by mere visiting of officials. Resident governors closely linked to the reigning Inca, of a kind so often mentioned in these sources, would, would almost certainly be crucial. On the basis of this assumption, the respective roles of governors and visitors appears to, to be distinct. The local lords. Many of these Caracas could boast of a long dynastic history. In the first stages of their expansion, the Incas confronted the important kingdoms of the Colau region. 
Early conquests also included the traditional principalities of the south coast of Peru. A few were still in the process of extending their own bounds at the time when they succumbed to the Incas. Their institutions may have influenced their new masters and thus become a factor in the development of Inca statecraft. Caracas was a generalized term for rulers of domains very different size and standing. Certain Caracas reigned over substantial territories. Others were relatively small fry. Murrow points out that according to both Garcilasco and Cobo, those in charge of 50 or fewer households worked in the fields like tax-paying commoners. Such a settlement w would amount to 200 to 300 souls, whose leader would be a local man linked by endless ties of kinship to his community. Those responsible for a hundred or more households were allegedly free of the imperial corvée labor service, though some chroniclers say that only Caracas in, Caracas in charge rather, of 500 or 1,000 households were exempt. As Mora also observes, information on these ethnic lords derived from traditional sources is incomplete. The terms cacique and principal used to describe them are imprecise, as they are applied equally to the headmen of a small valley with three or four villages and to the king of Chimor, sometimes described as an emperor. Only with the publication of the Lupaca and Juanuco visis visitas has it become possible to assess the role of the Caracas within the empire and to appreciate the great dis disparities in their status. Such disparities arose not only from the size of their domains, but also from the profound cultural differences between the Sierra and the coast, between groups of herdsmen in the Altiplano, and communities that controlled irrigated lands at lower altitudes. The Inca ruler, in effect the Inca state, became the theoretical owner not only of all land in conquered provinces, but, uh, but also of all mines and herds. Murrah, however, stresses the key role of the Caracas in imperial administration. Inca control was somewhat indirect, and the Caracas were left in charge of local affairs. From the Inca point of view, the most important function of these traditional lords was to provide band power, both for military and civilian purposes. According to the available evidence, Caracas were seldom removed from office. Moreover, the Caracas retained the right to labor service from the people of his community. Reports from Spanish administrators who had daily contact with local lords after the conquest confirmed that they were entitled to labor sufficient for the cultivation of their lands in Inca times, though they did not receive tribute. Such service formed part of their established rights, and their houses were also built by communal labor. Garcilasco writes of Caraca land ownership and confirms that in each community the people had an obligation to cultivate the holdings of the Caraca. Always anxious to stress the benign nature of Inca rule, he further states that the poorer people only had the duty to serve the Caraca after they had worked on their own fields, and claims that during the reign of Huayna Capac, an official was put to death because he arranged for the cultivation of the lord's property before that of a poor widow. Garcilasco adds the, that cultivation of the lands of those on m military service or of widows and or orphans was also a communal responsibility. Vasto writes of the numerous texts that bear witness to the Caracas' possession of land cultivated by the city. The extent of these Caracas properties, however, varied greatly from one region to the next. Vasto cites reports of these fairly large holdings, such as those in the Chincha Valley and others in the Lupaca territory. Because the lands belonging to the Inca and the Caracas would have served no useful purpose for their owners if they had no labor, no labor force under their control, local and imperial rulers, in effect, received tribute in the form of labor. According to Cobo, the Caracas even exercised a certain authority over groups of Mitames whom the Incas had settled in their territory. He writes that whereas they were freed from obedience to their former caciques, they were ordered to submit to those controlling the lands to which they were sent. The settlers retained their traditional dress and emblems, but in other respects were expected to follow the custom and the way of life in the place in which they were settled and to obey its rulers. Apart from their administrative functions and their rights to the service of labor to till their fields, the Caracas played a key role in the exchange of gifts, based, basic to the complex, complex rather, Inca system of reciprocity. Polo is adamant that the peasant's only obligation was to till the soil. He insists that if the Caracas had large quantities of clothing, this had been woven not by the community but by his numerous wives. However, Castro and Ortega include the fabrication of textiles among the services to which Caracas were entitled. As a possible explanation for this discrepancy, the Caracas might have pretended after the conquest that they had indeed received such benefits during Inca times, even if their subjects denied this. Though the Caracas retained certain powers and privileges, Inca control was fairly strict. The sons of provincial lords, presumably only those of the more important members of this elite, were obliged to reside at the Inca's court from the age of 14 or 15, 
enabling their Inca masters to better judge which son would be the most suitable successor. Kobo describes the pragmatic approach of the Inca authorities toward the Caracas, who on the whole seem to have managed to preserve the loyalty of their people. The Incas took advantage of the prestige of local rulers in order to bolster their own standing and did not hesitate to change the boundaries of the Caracas' dom domains, adding to some at the expense of others. The governors kept a watchful eye over the local lords and prevented them from treating their subjects badly. If a Caracas was judged guilty of any grave misdemeanor, he could be removed. Siesa, however, implies that in practice they were loath to dispose Caracas because such a course would arouse the, the people's sentiments. The state seemingly had the last word in the choice of a Caracas' successor, who was not necessarily his eldest son. Castro and Ortega affirmed that, both on the coast and in the Sierra, a Caracas would select the successor, whether son, brother, or nephew, who would best conform to Inca notions and present him to the Inca authorities. If the successor was not a close relative, he inherited only the office of ruler but not the possessions of his predecessor. Damián de la Bandera suggests that normally the Caraca preferred to nominate as here the most apt of his own sons. In cases where a Caraca died without having put forward a successor, the, the Inca governor would choose a suitable candidate with the aid of Kipu records. Other limitations were placed on the powers wielded by the Caracas over their subjects. They were forbidden to put individuals to death, for example, but could flog them in certain instances. The Caracas, moreover, were held to certain rules of protocol whereby the most important took precedence over those of lesser standing. Garcilasco relates that only a high-ranking Caracas had the privilege of making a ceremonial toast to the ruler, to whom he would present his cup after drinking. For his part, the Inca could drink with all the orejones, or capitanes. The Inca was nonetheless careful to treat with each great affability even the lesser provincial lords and instructed certain Incas by privilege to take his place in drinking toasts with them. In general terms, it was not the Inca's interests to suppress the ancient institutions of the conquered peoples. Out of respect for local tra tradition, they granted Caracas a certain authority but kept them on a tight rein and compelled them to serve imperial ends. Caracas's resources were considerably curtailed by comparison with pre-Inca times, when surplus wealth drained off from the population would have been at their entire disposal. More, aptly summing up the situation, says that, that although local rulers were not removed nor stripped of their property, they ceased to enjoy their previous powers. They could not exploit the local population for their own ends beyond a fixed point. This was not entirely an indication of Inca benevolence toward the people. There also probably was concern that the Caracas might rebel or that they might compete too successfully with the central power for local resources. Even the Inca governors, who formed a trusted inner circle, were spied upon and forced by law to depend upon the king for certain sumptuary goods. A, f a further unresolved matter is the degree to which these local potentates or single rulers, or whether, in at least some instances, they operated in pairs, presiding over the upper and lower portions of their domain. Polo, for instance, implies that this division into Upper Hanan and Lower Urin existed throughout the empire. The degree to which such diversion was a uniform pattern of social organization that has been much debated in recent times. Its presence in the Inca Empire was perhaps regional rather than universal. Such divisions are rarely mentioned, for instance, in the case of Huanuco. Many Spanish chroniclers erroneously wrote of a single dynasty of, among the Lupaca, whereas Chuquito was subject to two kings having equal access to its resources. Subordinate centers within this realm were also controlled by pairs of lords subject to the chief rulers. Certainly, dual rule was present in the Inca provinces of the south coast. For example, Ross Rovaski discusses the possible division of the principality of Mara Mara Maranga, as also occurs in the other coastal Curacascos. The use of the name Hatun Chaucha in Incan times suggests also the presence in that center of the Anan Udin system, and Rostrovaski even suggests that the kingdom of Chimur might have possessed two rulers. The Imperial Cult The Imperial Cult, as an instrument that served to unify the empire, is attributed to its founder, Bachakutek. As Laura Lawrence Milnelli writes, this ideology centered on Cusco served as a model not only of the empire but of the entire universe as Tawantin Tsuyu was conceived as a corresponding with the universe itself. Before further discussion of other aspects of administration, this spiritual or religious factor should first be mentioned, both as a possible motive for conquest and as a means of securing the Incaization of those conquered. 
The religious factor, moreover, is inseparable from secular concerns, as the church was granted large holdings of property throughout the empire. The sources who stress the widespread imposition of the solar deity Inti, who serves as dynastic ancestor to the Inca ruler himself, the son of the sun. Damaris refers to the Inca's manipulation of the Andean high god based on the emphasis of the solar aspects of this celestial godhead, as compared with the other sky creator deities of other highland groups. For instance, the sun was not extensively worshipped by the Kola, and was certainly not their dominant sky god, as it was among the Incas. To quote another example, Castro and Ortega state that the Yungas of the Peruvian South Coast worship a variety of huacas, and that it was Tupac Inca who had ordered them to adopt a cult of the sun as part of their religion. The Incas reportedly would take hostage the main idol of a newly conquered province and place it in Cusco, where it was honored with the same ceremonies as in its place of origin. People from that province were sent to Cusco to ensure the correct observance of the rites of their local deity, whose, eff whose effigy was, n was now lodged in the capital. Whereas provincial deities were thus honored in Cusco, Cobo suggests that the Incas tended to, l to limit the local observance of the previous rites of these conquered peoples. Siesa, by contrast, confirms the general imposition of the cult of the sun, but denies that this implied the suppression of older religious customs. The latter view seems more acceptable, as the Incas would have surely been loath to, to circumscribe, for instance in Colau, the worship of deities that in some form or another were fundamental to the genesis of their own pantheon. In Cusco, solar worship became to be the dominant religious force, and the sun cult was preeminent in coronation and funeral ceremonies and in most of the principal rites. The services served to deepen the veneration for the, for the ruler as a, as a prince of solar descent. In the main centers, the principal temple was dedicated to the cult of the sun, imposed as the symbol of imperial rule. Siesa writes of the magnificence of the sun temple in Tumebamba, Huanacapax's northern capital. Some of its inhabitants reported that much of the finely cut stone of which the shrine was built had been bought from Cusco. Siesa further describes his vast store of valuable objects and relates that to 200 of the most beautiful Kanyani virgins were, de were dedicated to its service. Language and Culture Imperial cohesion was also furthered by the use of the Quechua language throughout the Inca domain. At least, the provincial elites were expected to know the language of Cusco. Moreover, Quechua would have been useful as a lingua franca among the babel of tongues created by the relocation of so many groups of Minamis from one corner to, of the empire to another. Le Villiers writes that the confusing medley of languages among such migrants obliged it at times to use Quechua and conserve their, their native idiom in places where another native tongue prevailed. Faced with the situation, the viceroy Francisco de Toledo, convinced that Quechua would be the best instrument for spreading the gospel, established chairs in Lima University for teaching that language, in which the catechism was also printed. In spite of the rather short period of Inca rule in Ecuador, there is little doubt that the lingua franca use of Quechua was well established in Otavalo, and from Quito southward in the Sierra, its prevalence is unquestioned. Nearly all communities affirmed its presence, and even those who did not do so introduced Quechua words beyond the common Hispano-Quechua jargon of, admi of administration. Equally, Spaniards reported that in northwestern Argentina some 70 years after the Inca conquest, Quechua was spoken in addition to, lo to local tongues such, such as Cacan. However, it is seen that by a process of diffusion, elements of Aymara had also spread to this region. In Colau itself, Quechua was used in areas where foreign colonists were settled. For example, it was spoken in Paucarcola, 10 kilometers distant from Hatuncola. Apart from their imposition of the solar cult and the diffusion of the Quechua tongue, it is open to question how far the Incas sought, in their brief spell of rule, to establish a uniform cultural pattern in general. Among the sure signs of their occupation of a given area is the presence of Inca or, or Inca-inspired pottery. Nowadays, perhaps, a more reliable guide to the extent of their conquests than the written texts. Quite apart from its use as an indication of imperial frontiers, archaeological evidence gives clues as to the intensity of Inca cultural penetration. In particular, elements of Inca culture tend to be more apparent in the Sierra than in the coastal provinces, which were more able to preserve their own traditions. According to Dorothy Menzo, most late horizon sites on the Peruvian south coast show comparatively little sign of Inca influence. Evidence from the late intermediate and late horizon su su suggests that the Chinchas had highly established had established rather a highly centralized pattern of control before the coming of the Incas, who merely took over the existing machinery of government. Their administrative center in the Chilon Valley had probably been built before the Incas conquered the territory. Their administrative center in the Chilon Valley had probably been, been built before the Incas conquered the territory.
DLA even sug suggests that in regions already as highly developed as the Chilon Valley, the Incas could exercise control without heavy per permanent occupation. Farther north, in the Moche Valley, the heart of the Kingdom of Chimur, no concentration of Inca type pottery has been located. In marked contrast, in the Lupaca territory, Inca cultural artifacts are much more visible, to the point that it is almost impossible to distinguish between Chiquito and Inca type ceramics, whether utilitarian or ceremonial. Indeed, not only the elites but also the ordinary people commonly used Inca style pottery among the Lupaca. The time factor is, a, is naturally a crucial element in affecting the intensity of Inca penetration. For instance, Myers points to the presence of Cusco type pottery in Tumebamba, whereas Quito, a more recent conquest, can scarcely even be regarded as an imperial center. Similarly in Chile, evidence of Inca settlements suffers a notable decrease to the south of the Rio Maipo, though Steberg does describe one site in front of in fr the fort of Chena, near present-day Santiago. Pottery found at Chena with Inca-type des designs suggests the existence of some significant administrative center in the vicinity. Intermediate cases can also be cited in which Inca-style ceramics are less in evidence than pottery that represents a, lo a local form blended with certain inf Inca influences. Rafino describes the Diaguita ware found in the present-day Chilean provinces of Atacama and Coquimbo, parts of which were conquered somewhat earlier than the Santiago region. In the phase known as Diaguita III, a hybrid pottery was produced that combined local and Inca forms. Another mixed style, Inca Paya, appears both in northern Chile and in northwest Argentina, as well as in southern Bolivia. Vestiges of Inca-style construction also shed light on Inca occupation. In general terms, their architecture was characterized by the use of finely cut stone as opposed to adobe or wood. It thus derives from a long tradition already present in the Huadi Tijuanaco area. Another distinguishing feature is the use of trapezoidal doors and windows, as identifiable in the important center of Juan Duco, for instance, an Inca city normally consisted of four principal sectors situated around a large central plaza. Close scrutiny of the fine buildings of Huanuco indicates that most were constructed by local personnel rather than by people imported from Cusco. Outside the area of central Peru, the nature of Inca constructions depended not only on the time depth of Inca occupation, but also on the importance of the site. Siesta's account of the magnificence of the remains of Tumebamba has already been cited. But the city was important enough to rank as a second capital under Juana Capac, with architecture that displays Cusco's best stone-cutting techniques. A few finely constructed Inca buildings and sites around Lake Titicaca, such as Silustani and Coati, bear witness to the significance of Colasuyu to the empire as a whole. The impressive temples were the product of a policy of close integration of this region. By contrast, no large Inca temples have been located farther to the south, and in northwestern Argentina, architectural remains tend more to represent an attempt to blend Inca and lo local styles. Only in the Cochabamba region of Bolivia, southeast of Lake Titicaca, are certain more positive Inca traits to be found in such sites as Incalacta and Incaracay, but the latter was as much a, f a fortress as a place of residence. Land and property. As in other pre-industrial societies, possession of land symbolized both wealth and status among the Incas. However, accounts of the system of land holding throughout the empire expose apparent discrepancies between theory and practice. Cobble's resume of earlier data gives a useful outline of this rather complex problem. He asserts that when the Incas conquered a town or province, they would divide the cultivated land into three parts, the first for the state re religion, the second for the ruler himself, and the remaining third for the community as a whole. Church lands were used to cultivate maize, whose ritual significance was important, and possibly other products required for ceremonial purposes, as well as to provide food for the priests of various deities. In many places, the division between church and state was not equal. In some cases, the ruler's share was the largest, but in others, the greater part of the land belonged to the cult of the sun and other religious entities. Cobo writes that care was taken to leave the people enough land to produce their food, but holdings assigned to the com community in theory also belonged to the ruler, and the population was only granted the usufruct. The Caracas were responsible for the division of these community holdings among the common people in accordance with the size of each family. If any members were absent, presumably on military or corvée service, others would till their fields. In addition, certain individual holdings of land represented a gift from the ruler as a reward for the performance of some outstanding service, whether in war or in civil administration. Murasides Polo and Huaman Poma as suggesting that community holdings were reallocated annually 
though he questions the accuracy of the statement. The countless reports, such as those of Polo de Ondegardo and Cobo, insist that the Inca state disposed of all conquered lands. Murra interprets this assertion as a legal fiction propagated by Inca authorities and designed to afford the sovereign the power to assign and manipulate land. The situation also prevailed elsewhere. For example, in parts of Africa, the kings owned land that was, in fact, under the control of their warriors. However, in practice, the authority of the monarch, whether Inca or African, was always limited by some prevailing economic system, bound by traditional rights and needs. In such systems, royal or state's rights and those of the community were basic factors. Inca conquests had put an end to warfare between various ethnic groups, but disputes surely continued over boundaries, particularly those of communal lands. Copious evidence survives of litigation in Inca times as a substitute for violence in the settlement of each of such differences. Rather, Mura, in seeking to analyze reports of what was in effect more a ritual than an actual pattern of distribution of conquered land, outlines features that were probably basic to the Inca system as it existed in practice. First was the continued cultivation by peasants of typical Andean crops involving a, a plan of ethnic holdings that survived the act of Inca domination. Such holdings of necessity continued to survive because it would be dangerous for the Inca to place limits on the self-sufficiency of the peasants. The second feature was the assignment, after Inca conquest, of productive holdings to the state or to the solar cult. Part of these holdings might have been obtained from previously uncultivated land made productive through the introduction of improved forms of farming, such as irrigation or terracing, by the conquerors. When this was not sufficient, particularly on the coast, lands cultivated by the peasants would have been expropriated by the state. In addition, certain other categories of holdings surely existed. Lands that provided for the traditional lords, whether important princes such as the Timu rulers or local Caracas of lesser status. Lands presented by the Inca to individuals as a reward for special services. Domains assigned to the ruling dynasty, whether to the present monarch or to his dead predecessors. And new assignments to Midimese settlers brought in by the state. With regard to royal holdings, European chroniclers consistently confuse these with state-held lands. The ruler and his predecessors had considerable estates in the vicinity of Cusco, but their personal property in the provinces, though mentioned by the sources, was not necessarily as extensive as that of the state. The Caracas's rights over land, according to Murr, are hard to define because of confusion in the sources between traditional entitlements and those subsequently conferred by Inca rulers. It is very possible that gifts of land by the ruler to a Caracas were nothing more than a confirmation by the state of existing rights or a reformulation of the pretense that all conquered lands belonged to the state and that it was only through the magnanimity, the magnanimity of the state that such rights were preserved. Certainly, much evidence points to the existence of Caracas holdings, though reports from Castro and Ortega on the Chincha Valley and others on the Kingdom of Chimor suggest that Caracas land ownership could take various forms. Basically, such lands were not really gifts from a bounteous Inca, but properties retained by their original owners after their domain had been conquered. More, as we have seen, suggests yet another possible category of land holding, that of the Inca provincial governors. As Shehdel also observes, the Inca system of land control can only be partly reconstructed from the available data. The lands of the sun present no real problem as they were admi administered by the state religion in corporate fashion. The situation of the state lands is less clear. In the, in the Cusco region, part was divided into holdings of the Panacas. At the provincial level, at least two types of state lands existed, as the Mitame enclaves formed a specialized version of state tenure. Polo de Ondegardo, who is almost alone among the, the chroniclers in assessing the relative shares of land assigned to church and state, affirms that in general terms the latter's portion was larger. Whereas outright state ownership of all land may thus have been in many respects a legal fiction, the Inca claim to ownership, or at least control, of mining rights is perhaps more clearly def defined. Among the Andean civilizations, metallurgy was an ancient craft, but only in the second half of the 15th century did the Inca thirst for gold lead to intensive exploitation over a large area. Inca, gold control, Inca control of gold mining is widely reported. A major incentive for the conquest of part of distant Chile was the presence of precious metals, the mining of which was controlled by the Inca rulers. Historical evidence exists of Inca mining activity in northwestern Argentina, and perhaps the lure of gold was also the main motive for the Incas' conquest of this region though data pertaining to this point are hardly conclusive. Archaeological evidence, moreover, demonstrates that the quest for the other metals also motivated the Inca advance into Chile. Hans Niemeyer writes of the Copiapo region as rich not only in gold but also in silver and copper. He describes furnaces and other equipment bought by the Inca conquerors to that region for the, for the purpose of refining these metals. Mining activity was widespread throughout the empire. Jean Bertolo, 
In writing of the, of the Mines of Kalao, also points to the chronicler's insistence that the precious metals were destined for the Inca ruler, which may be taken to mean the ruling caste in general, and the state cults. But the same author observes that both provincial governors and caciques made presents of gold and silver to the ruler, which suggests that the Caracas also participated in the exploitation of the mines, if only to the degree that would have enabled them to bestow gifts on their sovereign. Writing more specifically of the Carabaya and Laracaja mines, situated to the northeast of Lake Titicaca, Bertolo cites colonial documents to the effect that certain mines in this region could be freely exploited by the lo local population, thus making a clear distinction between the quote-unquote Inca's mines and the quote-unquote community's mines, though the chronicler stressed the use of gold and silver, copper, which since Mocha times have been used for making implements, was probably also important. The same point applies to another major source of wealth, the great herds of camelois consisting of llamas, vicuñas, and alpacas. They originally abounded above all in Kola Suyu, where the local rulers possessed large herds. They were prized for their wool, which provided the luxury textiles used in religious rites, and also for their value in the complex procedure of offering gifts to the ruler and, the, and to the elite. Kumpi, the finest cloth of all, was made of alpaca wool. The Inca himself consumed an abundance of cloth. He seldom wore a garment more than once and would change clothing several times a day, and his litter was completely covered with the finest mat material. The llama, the, the llama was also important as a beast of burden, though it carried a, re a relatively light load. The animal itself, as well as the textiles made of its wool, played a part in, in Inca religion as an important sacrificial offering, white llamas being pref the preferred victims of the sun. Llamas were offered in southern Bolivia, not only to the sun, but also to Ilapa, the thunder god. In important funerary rites, at times invo involving human sacrifice, the principal offering would consist of the finest textiles, including woolen robes threaded with gold. A large proportion of the herds seemed to have belonged to the imperial authorities, though any statistical comparison between those of the state and those of the church is hard to make. The Inca, moreover, established herds in many regions where none had existed before. Hence, the state herds were very numerous, serving military as well as ceremonial ends. It is probable that in places where herds had existed before the Inca conquest, the Caracas and her subjects were not altogether de deprived of cameloids. In view of the Incas' tendency to maintain good re relations, local potentates, particularly in Calau, would surely not have been completely stripped of their possessions in this respect. It seems, therefore, that throughout the empire, the claim to full and outright state ownership, whether of land, mines, or herds, was more a concept than a fact. It simply served to assert the imperial powers' right to general control over wealth. Such rights, however, did not in practice allow the Inca to confiscate all property of either the local lords or their subjects, without whose compliance such an unwieldy domain would have been ungovernable. Mass Resettlement I have already stressed the supreme importance of the mass settlement of Mitame groups from the Valley of Cusco in pacifying and controlling newly conquered provinces and ensuring their adoption of elements of Inca culture. The Incas were usually able, after a certain time had passed, to instill such a total subservience to the will of the divine ruler that their subjects meekly obeyed his command to forsake their cherished homeland and migrate to a remote and newly conquered region. Here they would preserve their own rights and customs, at the same time fostering the process of absorption whereby the local inhabitants were converted into loyal subjects. Murrah sums up the wide use of the system in Ecuador, quote, where serious opposition was met, as is in the case of Cañari, Puruja, and Cara, native organization was smashed by removing a large part of the population and replacing it with Mirames, settlers from other parts of the empire who were by then regarded as thoroughly acculturated and reliable. Thus, thousands of, of Palta were taken to Colau and replaced with Bolivians. According to Oviedo, as cited by Mura, all the inhabitants of the, of the Quito region were in his time either Quechua or Aymara-speaking Indians from, Bol from Bolivia, the natives having been deported south. Mura describes this as an overstatement, as the Puruja language, native to the region, was spoken as late as 1692, even though very many inhabitants have been deported long ago by the Incas. Mura names various peoples in northern Ecuador whose land had been settled by southern colonists. Such enclaves within the aboriginal population served as focal centers of Inca influence, and today some of these settlements can still be distinguished by the dress and customs of their inhabitants. Not all the Mirame settled in Ecuador came afar. 
Valdemar Espinosa relates how Tupac conquered the Huayacuntus, situated to the east of Birua in southern Ecuador. Their chief, Apo Guacal, became a fervent Inca supporter. He brought a contingent of his warriors to help Juana Capac in the fierce struggle against the Caranquis and other tribes to the north of Quito. When the war ended, the rulers settled a large number of Huayacuntus in Quito itself, where they were active in repressing opposition to Inca rule. Siesa divides the Minamés into three categories. The first, having both social and mi military functions, consisted of those sent when a new territory was organized into provinces. They were relocated not only for security reasons, but also to aid the process of educating the local inhabitants and converting them into loyal subjects. The second category, serving purely military ends, comprised those dispatched to, est to establish garrisons for protection against savage frontier peoples, such as the Chunchos and Mojos. Metame enclaves of this type were also stationed farther north along the crucial frontier region of the ever rebellious Bracamoros and Chachapoyas, as well as among the Caranquis, who fought for so long against Juana Capac. The third type of Metames, economic rather than military, were those sent to the population to populate mountain valleys that were fertile but lacked people to till the soil. Kobol also describes this this system, quote. The Inca introduced this change of residence in order to keep his domain quiet and safe. The city of Cusco was far away the most from the most remote provinces in which there were many nations of warlike and barbaric people. Thereafter, the Inca felt that he could not maintain peace and obedience in any other way. And since this was a reason why this measure was taken, the Inca ordered that the majority of the Minamés who are made to go to recently subjugated towns settle in the provincial capital so that they could serve as a garrison and presidio not for a salary or for a limited time. Rather, the Mitames and their descendants would remain perpetually. And, as would be the case with, with warriors, they were given some privileges so they would appear to be more noble, and the Inca commanded that they always be very obedient and do whatever their captains and governors might order. Kobol further states that when the ruler subjected a, a, a province, he would remove as many as six or seven thousand families to a more settled region and replace them with groups of mitames that sometimes even included orejones from Cusco. Though these mitames were instructed to follow the customs of the places to which they had been relocated, they retained the dress and outer symbols of their own nation. Even at the time when Kobo wrote in the in mid seventeenth century, such people could could be still distinguished from the original natives. The mitame system was doubtless expanded in the time of the later rulers. Cabello suggests that it was initiated by Tupac. However, resettlement had also occurred in Colasuyu, which was among the very earliest conquests. For example, according to Diaz de San Miguel, a group from Chinchasuyu was located in the Cola presence of um Umaisuyu. Valdemar Espinoza, who has contributed much to the study of the Mitame system, describes it as vital to the very existence of the empire. In stressing its military aspect, Espinosa quotes Garcia Diaz as relating that Juana Capac employed 6,000 men brought from the Lubaca region against the Cayambis. Of these, 5,000 perished. The same author adds that the interesting detail that in the Lubaca kingdom, 80% of the Minamés who had been settled there, probably at a relatively early date, came from the valley of Cusco. Of the remaining 20%, some were Chancas. Examples of the use of Minamés survived throughout the empire. For example, they played a key part, as mentioned earlier, in the absorption of the important center of Cochabamba, first conquered by Tupac, who sent contingents of its inhabitants eastward to Bocona. Factel cites documentary evidence of the dispatch to Cochabamba of contingents of Charcas, as well as Quil Quilacas and Carangas, situated in the, in the region between Cochabamba and the coast of Chile. Factel states that further large contingents of Mirames were brought to Cochabamba by Juana Capac, and that in his reign their function had become more economic than military. Some of these settlers had come from places as far distant as Quito. Juana Capac also introduced a group of silversmiths from Chinchasuyu, who were compelled to cross over to the Andes on their arduous trek. Artisans from the Pacific Coast are also known to have been settled in Cusco. Labor Service and Tribute Many chroniclers write of the imperial system of taxation and tribute. Santillan's information, in this instance not borrowed from earlier sources, suggests that the Inca, in fixing the quota of a given province, would only demand goods produced locally or available in nearby lands. The Caracas were obliged to give orders to their subjects to work for the Inca. Once their task was done, the same people would then help to produce crops and clothing for the Caracas, who thus also received a form of payment. 
The latter were themselves exempt of any contribution. Santillan cites as the examples of tribute not only food but also fine clothing and feather work, together with objects of gold and silver. In case of war, arms were supplied to the Inca forces. Luxury items such as gold and feathers were sent to Cusco, along with some food, the remainder being consigned to local storehouses. Cobo confirms that not only Orejones but also Caracas were exempt from payment. They did give valuable presents to the ruler, but these were quote-unquote voluntary and hence did not rank as tribute. As part of the elaborate system of reciprocity, the Inca would give jewels and fine garments to captains who had shown valor in, in war, but the most prized gift of all was that of a maiden from among those gathered as tribute, along with livestock and farmlands. Cobo affirms that payment by the common people was made in the form of personal service. In place of paying tribute, the craftsmen worked in the service of the Inca, the religion or their caciques. Each one performed the craft that he knew, such as making garments, working gold or silver, extracting these metals from the mines and processing them, making clay and wooden cups, and the other crafts. As long as they were employed in fulfilling their quotas and tributes with the crafts and jobs, both the craftsmen and the artisans, as well as the communities of the towns and mitayos, were supported at the expense of the owner of the estate where they worked or the person they served, even though it might be the estate of the Inca or religion. And from this same estate, they were also given the tools along with the rest of their instruments and necessary equ equipment. They did, they did not invest anything of their own except manual labor. Cobol goes on to explain that officials in Caracas were not paid in the form of gold or silver, but received as payment the personal service of the subjects residing in their districts and placed under their command. They were assigned a certain number of laborers, the number that would suffice for their own needs. The ordinary rate was one laborer for every hundred subjects. Quite apart from performing services within the, the Caracas' houses, local inhabitants cultivated their fields and looked after their livestock. Such service took the place of a salary. These and other reports led Murrah to stress that tribute consisted basically not of goods or cash, but of labor that the peasant community gave to the state and the Caraca. For instance, certain groups such as the Uru, a rather primitive people living on the shores of Lake Titicaca, provided only fish and had no obligation to serve in the army or participate in major public works. Mita was the germ, was the term rather, generally used for the part-time labor service imposed upon the peasant population. Such labor was far from limited to cultivation of fields and production of goods for the ru ruling class. In addition, Mita labor met the demand for construction of temples and palaces in both Cusco and the provinces, as well as for road, road building, work on fortresses, irrigation, mining projects, and transportation of goods and materials from one place to another. The labor needed for transportation alone must have been colossal. For instance, Juan de Capac ordered that plentiful supplies of timber for, m m for making rafts should be carried from the coast of Ecuador all the way to the shore of Lake Titicaca, a distance of 1,500 kilometers. It is hard to determine whether some of these tasks, particularly those involving infrastructure, were performed by r rotative mita labors or by llanas. Nor do we know how such tasks were reconciled with the agricultural cycle. Any full-time labor force basically of Yanas who were in, in, in effect state or at times individual servants. Information as to their origins, their numbers, and their precise status is far from complete. Murray states that he simply does not know if they were slaves. Present studies of dependency and slavery hardly provide any ready classification. Huaman Poma treats the term Yana as synonymous with slave, but states, nonetheless, that the authorities managed to extract from some of them payments of gold and silver. In view of doubts over the availability of sufficient numbers of Yanas or of part-time Mita workers to fulfill the massive demands for state labor, the question arises as to how far Mitame colonists, at least in certain regions, might have taken the role of Yanas working as full-time serfs. Valdemar Espinosa, on the basis of colonial documents stating that large groups from the north coast of Peru were moved to the Sierra regions of Cajamarca, questions whether these coastal mitimes might have served in this capacity. Some of these mitimes were relocated in Chultin on the edge of the valley of Cajamarca. They were expert potters, and their only task was to produce ceramics for the state. In certain instances, the term mitime was perhaps becoming a euphemism, used as a protective label for people who in pre-Hispanic times had been captives or yanas. Whereas the yanas were recruited individually, 
The Mitsume system would have provided a method of obtaining serv servile, servile laborers, not singly but in groups. Another aspect of the division of labor is the reported use of the decimal system, not only for the army but also as a means of appointing the tasks of the inhabitants of a given area. The sources concur in saying that the peasants were divided into bodies of 10,000 to be placed under the control of a leading Kuraka. These would then be subdivided into 10 contingents of 1,000 and thereafter into smaller groups of 100, each administered by a lesser Kuraka. The group of 100 might be further split into yet smaller fractions of 50, 10, and even 5 workers. Numerous chroniclers report with certain vari variations the systematic division of Inca subjects into numerical groups. The partly interlinked accounts of Santillan, Castro, and Ortega, and de, and, de, and de la Bandera follow this report with an account of the subdividing of Indians into twelve ages, ranging from the first, consisting of people over sixty years old, to the twelfth, formed of infants between birth and two years. Though earlier investigators, such as Means, tended to take such statements at their face value, clearly such a bureaucratic round number scheme could not correspond to the demographic reality, as village populations cannot be made to conform to a precise decimal system. Nonetheless, a preference for such a neat arrangement might account for a tendency to adjust the boundaries of communities in order to attain a certain uniformity. An approximate decimal system could more easily be applied to military service, which forms such a major component of the, of the Mita system. The numbers recruited through the Mita are hard to quantify, but there is little doubt that Given the ever greater distances involved in the waging of imperial wars, the obligation became increasingly burdensome. The very nature of the system, requiring both the cultivation of land and many other non-military tasks, makes it improbable that such recruitment involved full-time service in the, in the army. Even if military service was the principal obligation of males, just as the weaving of cloth was the main task of females, the soldiers surely had to return to their villages for part of the time as old men and women could hardly be expected to cultivate not only their communal holdings but, but, but also the state lands. The universal obligation to serve the state, whether in a military or civilian capacity, was fundamental. Mirror cautions against underestimating the, re, the redistributive function of the crown but refutes any general notion of the Inca domain as a benign welfare state. At the same time, he draws attention to the insistence of many sources that tribute was paid not basically in goods but in labor. However, as Moore points out in the case of food production on the lands assigned to the Inca or to the sun, what Polo, Cobo, and other Spanish writers saw was the labor rather than the produce subsequently paid as tax. The chroniclers accepted without question the notion that the Inca and the sun held title to this land. They obviously reasoned that the Inca could hardly tax the land that he already owned and that Therefore, only the only tax levied took place in the form of labor. But what if the laborer contributed was but what if but if what the laborer contributed was service, excuse me, what the Inca, as well as the governors in Caracas, actually received was produce. A distinction surely needs to be made, therefore, between the many instances where a service was indeed personally rendered and received, and those in which service was rendered in the form of productive labor but in which the state actually received goods. Moreover, certain chroniclers quite plainly describe tributes payable in goods rather than labor. Ciesa, for instance, writes of specific quantities of gold, silver, clothing, and arms, the correct de delivery of which was monitored by Quipus. The cornucopia of sumptuary articles produced by craft specialists amazed the Spaniards, who found them both in, C in Cusco and in the provinces. This hoard presumably consisted both of items produced directly for the Inca by the local peasantry and of others made for the Caracas and then presented to the Inca as presents. The tributary system was not confined to goods produced solely for immediate use. It therefore necessitated an imposing storage network, both for sumptuary items and for regular surprises, supplies rather of food, arms, and clothing. In his archaeological study of Inca warehousing, Craig Morris describes facilities of enormous size and sophistication. Though the administrative records of storage for the most part perished with the last inter interpreter of the Kibunats, the storehouses themselves still dot the hills above the ruins of many Inca towns and cities, inviting archaeological research. A large portion of fine cloth and other goods that conferred st status naturally was sent to the capital, where much of the elite resided.
But the quantities mentioned in the reports, and actually seen by Spanish, appear to have far exceeded any conceivable needs of the upper social strata among the residents of Cusco. Many, if not most, of these goods went to the army and to the others in, the s in service of the state. One reason they went to Cusco was so that they could then come from Cusco. The prestige of gifts and issues was greatly enhanced by association with the ruler himself and with the imperial city. The huge amounts of cloth the Spanish saw in Cajamarca when they first set eyes on Inca stores were probably a temporary result of the, so of the sovereign's presence rather th than a sample of Cajamarca's usual supplies. Morris further stresses that the ordinary subsistence goods were mainly carried not to the capital but to the big provincial centers such as Juanaco Pampa and for the most part were consumed or stored there in order to support state activities. In centers built by the Incas along the principal roads, massive quantities of foodstuffs were stored down from the surrounding hinterland. In villages as opposed to towns, storage was usually limited to households and no large quantities were accumulated either for the state or for the local authorities. Evidence from the Lupaca territory suggests that fairly large amounts of goods were taken out of state storehouses and given to the local rulers, who might in turn use them to regale Inca capitanes and other leaders who passed through the province. It seems unlikely that any major portion trickled down to the common villagers. Hence, it becomes rather harder to pursue the welfare theory originally elaborated by Bodine and rather solidly refuted by Mura. In every storehouse, including the tambos situated at regular intervals along the roads, goods were meticulously counted by a capo camayo. Juan Poma provides an illustration of such a functionary, seen conversing with the reigning Inca, to whom he displays a quipo. The tributary and storage regime operated even in distant Ecuador in a limited zone, perhaps reflecting an early phase of imperial consolidation rather than the later stage of full-blown dom dominion. In the case of Harin and, Han and Hanan Chilo, situated in the Quito Basin to the south of the, s of the city, local lords who actually managed the tribute testify testified that after a large maize field was harvested, half the crop was sent to Quito. The other half was stored by the Caraca, to whom Mita workers were also sent to serve his house and make him some woolen clothing. In the final analysis, it may be right to describe the whole system as a form of, re of redistribution, but one that ministered to the well-being of the ruling classes more than to that of their humbler subjects. The latter at least derived some benefit from the additional employment thereby created, even in the case of sumptuary goods. What the elite received was not simply direct peasant labor, but the fruits of that labor in the form of goods. In the case of gold, the mines seemed to have mainly served the Inca. Even the Caracas were to a limited extent involved. In this, sense, in this instance, therefore, what the subject sites, cities rather, contributed was indeed basically labor. It must constantly be borne in mind that in the, tri in, that in the tributary or redistributive sy system, the common people provided not only for the Inca conquerors, but, but also for their own Caracas. As such, the system surely had ancient roots. Local lords of some kind had held sway since time immemorial, and agriculture and even mining had existed for countless centuries. Archaeology demonstrates the presence from Huati times of, st of storage facilities with capacities far surpassing mere local needs. What cannot be stated in exact terms is the extent to which the Incas, who improved the pr productivity of agriculture, herding, and mining, might have increased the total burden on the common man over what had already been imposed by traditional local lords. Vertical Archipelagos In general terms, the Inca Empire differed from that of the Aztecs in that it lacked the latter's established merchant class, honored by the ruler and second only to the nobles in power and prestige. The Incas, by contrast, displayed an aversion to the creation of an open market, in which goods native to different provinces might be traded freely th throughout their empire. They tended instead to favor a system aimed at securing for each region the maximum de degree of internal self-sufficiency, even though some interchange of goods between provinces seemingly continued. Fundamental to the attainment of such self-sufficiency was what Mur identified rather as the principle of verticality, whereby certain polities of the Sierra establish a series of productive settlements at lower and warmer levels on or near the coast, and occasionally also at altitudes higher than their main centers. These settlements formed a kind of vertical archipelago.
through which the main center was able to obtain a variety of produce native to a wide range of ecologies without recourse to formal trade with other regions. Jorge Flores Ochoa writes that such settlements might consist of both farmers and llama herders who provided transport. Many of the latter were native to the Lake Titicaca region. Data supported, pro provided rather by Ortiz de Zuniga's account of his 1562 visits to Juanuco, supported by fieldwork at Juanuco, convinced Mura of the probable existence since comparatively ancient chimes of a, s of a system that he described as the, as the vertical control of a maximum number of ecological levels. The establishment by the Incas of Bitume colonists in the Juanuco region was merely a later and altered manifestation of this system. Mira cites other examples to prove this hypothesis, of which perhaps the most striking is that of the Lupaca Kingdom, documented by the visits of García Díaz de San Miguel in 1567. This domain, much larger than Juanuco, possessed its own oases on the coast stretching from Arica, on the Chilean border with Peru, as far as Moquegua, about 150 kil kilometers to the northwest. Here, the Lupaca cultivated cotton and maize and, and obtained a whole variety of marine produce. They also had settlements in Laracacha La in Bolivia. The Lupaca were only one of various kingdoms of the Lake Titicaca region, and there is a strong possibility that others also possessed land and forests at lower elevations, thus giving rise to a veritable maze of multi-ethnic population distribution. Murrah and Vakdel stressed the great expansion of the system in the final decades of Inca rule. One particularly Andean feature is that these complementary outliers were frequently multi-ethnic. Representatives of polities quite distinct from each other in the mountains found themselves in close, if tense, proximity at the periphery. These settlements were five, ten, and sometimes even more days as walk distance from their respective power centers. The vertical archipelago thus implied a rather close economic circuit, linking several tiers through ties of kingship and political subordination. This greatly ex expanded scale of operations under the, under, uh, under the last rulers led to the settlement of Minimes up to 60 days' walk from their, from their homelands, suggesting that the vertical archipelago was undergoing fundamental change in the decades immediately before 1532. Some such colonies were assigned to mining or garrison duties rather than to agriculture. Colonists sent so far away from their ethnic homelands could no longer return there easily to exercise residual rights in farming. Mid-16th century documents from highland Ecuador, consisting of reports of Spanish visitas, suggest that in certain areas some form of verticality was established even in the more recently incorporated northern marches. In particular, the five eth ethnic lords of the Puruja communities were interviewed in 1556. The Purujas occupied the Riobamba territory, situated to the south of Quito. In this region, recognizably central or southern Andean techniques were adopted, and the previous discrepancy of these highland peoples on interchange with montaña groups of the tropical forest was eliminated. Instead, the Purujas were endowed in the montaña with their own outposts, which bloomed into a full-blown archipelago system. Of these forest settlements, many were cotton plantations. Maize tribute for the Inca was also produced in special enclaves at a different altitude. The Puruja vis Visita is one of a smaller number of sources that write in some detail of the internal management of archipelago systems. Nonetheless, Solomon, who describes the archipelago system as a radical measure, does not su suggest that it was applied with the same intensity in Ecuador as in certain provinces farther to the south. Oberem also writes that in Ecuador a form of micro-verticality was practiced rather than Murrah's macro-verticality. Murrah's hypothesis ranks as a major contribution to Andean social studies, but Murrah himself has been the first to concede that the system of vertical archipelagos had its limitations. Possibly conditions in certain parts of the Andes favored its development, whereas other parts were not as well disposed. The kingdoms around the shores of Lake Titicaca established islands toward the Pacific coast, but those of the Montaro Valley had none in the ocean, though they did make settlements on the edge of the forest. It might be added, moreover, that there is less historical evidence that coastal principalities practice what might be termed verticality in reverse. 
Conquest and consolidation by the Moche and later by Timor limited penetration into the highlands above about 2,000 meters. Pease also refers to Oberim's microverticality in the north. Although the system of verticality is generally accepted in the southern Andes, strong evidence of its presence in other areas has not been fully established. This is especially the case for the coast of present-day Peru, perhaps because this region lacks the sort of documentation of available for Chucuito and Huanuco. The possible existence of markets as an alternative to archipelagos as a means of obtaining spe specific types of produce requires further research. Moreover, any Inca predilection for a maximum degree of regional self-sufficiency -suff could only be partially realized through the archipelago system. Self-sufficiency would also have required a major increase in the production of the core region, while to provide for a growing population including settlements at different levels, and to satisfy the tributary demands of the Inca state. CSF, for instance, records that the Miname system populated barren areas to such an extent that in Inca times very little fertile land remained uncultivated. The chronicler sadly remarks that whereas the idolatrous Incas care for their extensive lands, the methods of the Christian Spaniards were basically dis destructive. Considerable evidence, moreover, bears witness to the Incas' skill in extending irrig irrigation works. One may recall Juan Capax's development of the Cochabamba Valley with the introduction of large numbers of mitames. Ever greater quantities of food were needed to maintain the large provincial centers that supported Inca conquest and expansion. The drive to increase production was, if anything, gaining momentum at the time of the conquest to a point that leads Craig Morris to write that projects aimed at improving output appear hardly to have begun when the, Sp when the Spaniards arrived. If the Incas introduced few new skills, their intensified use of established techniques achieved impressive results. Trade and Barter Though the Incas may have preferred such practices as the use of vertical archipelagos, the question nonetheless ar arises as to how far this rather closed economic system was or was not supplemented by more traditional types of interchange in the form of trade and barter. Some interchange of goods unquestionably occurred, but its volume and significance are less clear. Rostorowski, in her work on the pre-Hispanic Peruvian coastal peoples, devotes a whole chapter to the merchants of Chincha. Much of her information stems from an unpublished colonial document, according to which no less than 6,000 merchants traveled from Chincha to Cusco and Calao. They also went to Ecuador, from whence they obtained gold and emeralds for the Caracas of Ica. According to the same document, the Chincha merchants were the only ones in the whole empire who used a kind of currency in the form of pieces of, of copper. They also had established a fixed ratio of exchange between gold and silver. Rostorowski expresses surprise at the high number of traveling merchants, as the use of traders was for the Incas a somewhat alien concept. Through questioning the numbers, though questioning the numbers involved, she nonetheless accepts that in Inca times there was some continued presence of merchants in the Chincha coastal region, and cites examples of Chincha merchandise, such as shells and dried fish, that reached the Sierra. As she remarks, the Inca Empire was not as aesthetic as some his as some historians would pretend. And because of a short span of existence, its laws and customs had not been fully imposed throughout its vast expanse. Siesta writes of a, an impressive market in Potosi. However, he mentions the presence of, Sp of Spaniards, and because Potosi is basically colonial, this must surely have been a post-Inca de development. Mura, notwithstanding the, st the stress he, l he lays upon the Inca preference for vertical settlements as a substitute for trade, acknowledges the existence of merchants and markets in the north. However, he suggests that it is not yet possible to draw firm conclusions on, on Inca commerce because of the incomplete data offered by the sources. Susan Ramirez cites various chroniclers who tend to imply that, relatively late in the pre-conquest his history, the Incas encountered organized exchange in certain areas and, recognizing its significance, took measures to accommodate it within their system. Murray accepts as historical the descriptions of Samano Chedesh heard from Pizarro's pilots, who sighted a great raft off the coast of Ecuador. It included a cabin, had cotton sails, and carried impressive cargo. The merchandise, as described by Samano Chedes, was of a strictly ceremonial nature, consisting not only of shells but also of luxury textiles and gold and silver adornments. The only chroniclers recorded as having personally seen native crafts was Sarate who tells of a veritable fleet of sailing rafts in the vicinity in the island of Puna.
Some were big enough to have carried 50 men and 3 horses. Murrah poses the all-important but uncertain question as to whether such craft were employed by the state or by private merchants. In her work on the change of merchants, Russell Rowski also offers concrete examples of trading activity in Ecuador. She quotes the Relaciones Geográficas as reporting that in, o that in Otavalo, a comparatively recent Inca conquest in the, in the north of Ecuador, the local ruler treated his people like slaves, except for the merchants who merely paid tribute. Such traders even had dealings with people who lived beyond the imperial frontiers. Solomon, in describing certain changing patterns of trade, also mentions the presence of merchants and a market in the Quito region. Even peoples of the Amazon Montaña, such as the Quijos, probably sent exchange specialists of their own to Quito. Any tolerance on the part of the Incas for the traditional trade and barter in Ecuador might partly be due to the ritual importance attached to the mulu shells, or spondylus pictorum, available in the warmer Ecuadorian waters but not in the colder sea farther south. These shells, already greatly prized by the elite of Chimor, were in demand in the heartland of the empire and have even been found as far afield as northwestern Argentina and in Chile. Netherly, in writing of the Inca conquest of the southern coast of Peru, uh, Peru suggests that the Incas might have used the Chincha merchants as, intermedi as intermediaries to obtain supplies of spondylus from farther north. The conclusion might therefore be drawn that in specific instances, such as that of Ecuador, the Incas were slow to impose their general policy of state-controlled redistribution to the exclusion of private trade. Because the Incas did not control coastal Ecuador, it is hard to see how any state mechanism that excluded trade could, could have satisfied their insatiable demand for the spondylus shells for ritual use. However, Mera is probably correct in asserting that commerce in the Inca Empire was somewhat marginal. Further archaeological studies may shed more light on the question, but it might be hard to distinguish between genuine commercial links and administered trade, described by Poliani as a form of state-sponsored exchange of goods. The basic Inca policy seems to have been to eliminate pure commerce where practical and at all events to, to limit its scale. Theory and Practice Inca imperial administration, as we have seen, embodied certain fundamental principles. Basic to their system of provincial rule, as indeed to that of most great empires, was the control exercised by leading members of the essential hierarchy. In this instance, Huarejones of the highest standing, who acted as, a, as viceroys of the Inca ruler. The spiritual symbol of the imperial presence was an imposing temple to the sun. Still important as part of the machinery of government were the Caracas, the former rulers of conquered lands. These local dignitaries were permitted to retain part of their wealth, together with certain powers and privileges, but were subject to strict Inca control and obliged to send their sons to be educated in Cusco. The common people were compelled to devote part of their time to the state, whether to till the fields, fabricate goods, or serve in the army. Their output met the requirements of the state redistribution ne network backed by massive storage faci facilities. To ensure a degree of self-sufficiency, -suff each region became, in effect, a kind of a state within a state, supplying its own needs to the greatest possible extent. This aim was reinforced by the establishment of vertical archipelagos and the settling of large Mitame groups from other regions, both to supplement the local labor force and, where necessary, to provide more skilled craftsmen. But in an empire that was a mosaic of different ecologies, languages, and traditions, any theoretical model had to be applied with flexibility. It was almost impossible to impose identical conditions, for example, on petty highland chiefdoms, the great kingdom of Jimor and the traditional Aymara principalities of Kolao. If in theory the state was supreme and the Inca ruler and its gods own almost everything except the peasants' holdings, in practice many concessions were made to, es to established interest in terms of both power and property. Local traditions were respected. Where these were ancient and deep-rooted, as for instance, on the southern coast of Peru, Inca cultural penetration was more limited than in less developed regions. Equally, although the principle of verticality was significant as a means of achieving a degree of local self-sufficiency, it was far from all-embracing. It was one means to a given end, the reinforcement of a state-controlled re redistributive system. The system served, among other things, as a substitute for a market economy by providing for the interchange of the products from of different ecological zones. For instance, maize and cotton from temperate regions for wool from the Altiplano, Plano, 
But in this respect also, notwithstanding the predilection for state control inter interchange, there is a certain flexibility in, pr in practice, if one is to believe the reports of the existence of thousands of Chincha merchants. The presence of traders in Ecuador is also demonstrable and probably would have continued unless the Incas were ready to commit themselves to the conquest of the coast in quest of the greatly prized spondylus shells. It may be true, as certain authors maintain, that merchants were alien to the Inca spirit even in, if in practice their usefulness was acknowledged. Yet one may wonder why private trading, usually present in ancient empires as the most practical way of exchanging goods, was so little favored. Admittedly, the Incas practiced a strict system of control and were reluctant to delegate authority. In addition, their elites were small in number. Possibly they feared the rise of a large, enterprising, and prosperous class of merchants, hard to, conf hard to confine by force to one locality and free to move from place to place. This concludes Chapter 7.